everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Help for HDTV. Today, we have Sabina Beretta on with us, and she is from the Harvard Brain and Tissue Resource Center. And she's going to be talking to us, and she came in with a slideshow, which is really awesome for us, because usually we're talking about it and we don't get to see visuals, but we have visuals this time on Help for HDTV. And we're going to talk about brain donations, what the process looks like, and also how important it is for a community like HD to be able to advance research of the future through this gift that, that our loved ones give at their end of their life to, to change the future for people living with Huntington's disease. So I would love, uh, Sabina, for you to have you share your screen and we can start learning more about this resource center. Awesome. Thank you so much today for inviting me to chat with you, to talk about the brain donation. And I'd like to also thank anybody who may be interested in looking at this video. It's a difficult topic to discuss, but I just want to tell you today in part why it is so important, why we should all consider becoming brain donors, and also how it works. How do we make it work in a way that it is as smooth as possible, but also so fundamental for research on Huntington. So the first thing I'd like to say is we live in a really interesting time for research on brain disorders. And this is because we have new, very powerful methods that are allowing us to do research in a way that even five years ago we would have been dreaming about. And therefore, investigators, including myself, are coming up with findings and ideas and new hypotheses and potentially new results that will be particularly important and particularly relevant to finding new therapeutic approaches. The one that I'm showing here, just to give you an example, is work that my group, together with several collaborators, are doing in trying to put together something that has been really difficult until now. We know that Huntington is a genetic disease. We know exactly what gene and what part of a gene you may be familiar with this CAG repeats that expand through life. The problem is how do we put it together with changes in the brain and eventually with symptoms and eventually with therapeutic approaches. And we're getting so much closer thanks to work that has been doing in the last few years and particularly again these powerful new technologies that really allow us to link genetic factors with cells, changes in the cells, and in particular parts of the brain, and eventually with the symptoms. So this work is possible because of the generosity of many different people and their families who have been participating in this program and donating their brains after that allowing us to do these studies. So I wear two hats, I'm an investigator, I am a scientist to doing research on brain disorders, including Huntington disease, but I am also the director of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. It's a brain repository, part of the NIH Neurobiobank site. And our only mission is in fact to advance research on the human brain and on disorders of the nervous system. And we do this by collecting human brains after that and keeping them here, storing at our laboratories to distribute them to investigators, not only within the US, but across the world. So very many research groups are benefiting from this resource and are being able to study different, different brain disorders. I want to tell you a little bit about our repository. As I mentioned, we are part of the NIH Neurobiobank. It's a network of six different brain banks, including us. And again, supported and working directly with the Neurobiobank, both in collecting brain donation and in distributing tissue out for research. I'll tell you a little bit about about ourselves, I want to clarify that the process for brain donation that I'm going to discuss is specific for our repository. 
other repositories within the Neurobio Bank work in very similar manners, but there are other brain repositories and each of us have our own workflows. So please understand that this is very specific to our own repository. So again, we are a national resource. We have recently collected our 10,000 brain, so we now have over 10,000 human brain specimens from a variety of donors with neurological and psychiatric disorders, as well as healthy controls, which are just as precious. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, but our organization allows us to collect brain donation from anywhere within the US within a 24 hour interval or less. And this is important, I'll tell you more about it. And then again, to distribute samples across the US. Our tissue repository has a particular interest in Huntington disease. The first the director of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center was Dr. Edward Bird, who was a pioneer in the research on Huntington disease and started developing a network and a framework for research on Huntington at our site here in McLean Hospital, Harvard Medical School. We have continued his efforts through several years. We have been open since 1978. And since then, hundreds of studies on Huntington disease have been generated from our collection. The first thing I'd like to tell you about how to consider even brain donation is the possibility of registering to become a brain donor. Anybody can register and anybody can register a loved one on their behalf. And this is because the registration, although very helpful, is not essential and is not a consent. So in fact, a, a family member can register somebody if they cannot do it themselves, because this is not yet a consent. It is not essential, so people can call us at any time and we can accept the brain donation even from people that were not registered. This is our website. People can find information or you will be able to find a lot of information about brain donation. Why is it helpful to consider a registration? It's because it helps family members to start discussing brain donation, understanding the process, but also be prepared to either honor the donor wishes or be prepared to go through if that's what the family decides. As I mentioned, it's not a consent, it's not binding. Being registered does not mean that somebody will have to become a brain donor, it's just expressing a wish to become one. And we will never contact people or follow up at the time perhaps a loved one may be passing. We rely on the family, in particular on the legal next of kin, to contact us. What's the most important part to know about the brain donation on the moment, and that's why it's important to discuss it ahead of time, is that timing is absolutely of the essence. So between the time a brain donor passes to the time we need to receive the brain to our laboratories, we try to keep it within 24 hours. And this means that the family can notify us either when death may be imminent, that helps us start arranging and making all the logistics go smoother, or within the first few hours after the donor's passing. This will help us arrange for everything and making sure that we receive the tissue within the 24 hours from the time of passing. So I'll take you through the most important steps of a brain donation. The first one is calling us. So people can call our 800 number, 1-800-BRAIN-BANK. We have donation coordinators on call 
any day of the year. At any time and any day, somebody will respond to your call or call you within minutes. This is one of our donation coordinators, Darren, who has extensive expertise in coordinating these brain donations. What will happen is that we'll need to go through a screening process. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And once we can accept, once we determine we can accept a brain donation, we'll review the informed consent with the legal next of kin, make sure that all the terms are understood and eventually have the legal next of kin sign the consent. At that point, we take over the whole coordination of the brain donation. So we try to have the family not to be involved in any way. We understand it is a very difficult time, very painful time for the families. And we try not to have them involved or have to deal with any issue related to the brain donation. So we will arrange the recovery of the tissue we will arrange for the transportation to our laboratories. And something that is really important to us is that we cover all the costs that are related to the brain donation during the donation and later on should there be some. And this is really important for us to really emphasize it so that families understand that and if they are incurring on costs that we are not aware of, they notify us immediately so we can cover them. At this point, I would like to take a brief pause to discuss one of the most challenging and at times painful parts of our work, which is that despite all our efforts and our workflow to make this happen. At times, we are not able to accept the brain donation. And we do realize that this can be very difficult for a family. A family may just have lost a loved one, and we might not be able to go through. So I want to tell you why this may be occurring ahead of time so that people are prepared. At times, it is not possible because we might not be able to use the specimen, the tissue for research. This is, for instance, when there are penetrating injuries to the head or a major stroke, or the person, the donor was on a respirator for a very long time. And we have nuances on that that we discuss with the family. At times there are safety concerns related mostly to infectious diseases. So if the donor is known to be HIV or Hep C or Hep B positive, we cannot accept the brain donation. We are particularly careful with prion disease, both for the safety of the person doing the recovery, our own and the investigators that will use the tissue. And at times, unfortunately, there are logistic issues. For instance, the brain donation cannot be completed within the 24 hours. We try our best, but this, at times it's not possible. At times, a recovery specialist or a facility is not available. This is often, or not often, but at times true for areas that are a bit remote. We have a network of over 400 recovery specialists. We have places where this can happen, but at times it's just not possible. We realize it is difficult, and that's why we are emphasizing it at any step of the way. But most of the times, I would say at least 95% of the times, if not more, we are successful in recovering a brain donation. Once the tissue comes to us, it is prepared for distribution. So we dissect it, we store it in our minus 80 freezers. And then at that point, we need to work with the family to collect as many information about the donor. The more we have, the more we understand about the donor, the clinical history, the family history, the better the research will be. So we do that after the brain donation because at, that, at the time of the brain donation, we the time is sensitive. So within a week from the brain donation, we contact the family, we obtain a release of health record, we ask them to fill in 
a questionnaire, and this is really important information that we share in a de-identified, anonymous, anonymized manner with investigators, but it's really key in understanding more about each donor. And the more we know about their history, their age of onset to their family history, the better the research will be. We also put together a neuropathology report on all our donors. This is our uh, neuropathologist, Dr. Rockley. And the neuropathology report is shared with the legal next of kin and with authorization from the legal next of kin also with other either family members or for instance, clean, treating clinicians. So each family will receive a neuropathology report. Once we have put all this information together, so neuropathology, we do a, a serology and a toxicology screening, we have the health records. Then we meet with the larger group, in fact, larger than what is shown in this photo. And we discuss each case a little bit like a case conference. We put together our expertise, what we learned from the clinical records, the neuropathology report, and we come up with a set of diagnoses for each donor, which are then shared with investigators. And then finally, the whole point of this is to share tissue with investigators Investigators can request the tissue directly through an NIH run portal called the NeuroBioBank portal. This is the link. It's a fairly straightforward application, but we are always happy to discuss it with investigators and to help them through the process. And again, the point of this is to continue our research on Huntington disease and many other brain disorders to learn more about this disorder and to try to find more effective treatments. Because we only distribute very small samples of tissue just as much as the investigator needs for their research, you could think about a brain donation as a gift that keeps giving because each brain donation goes into several hundred studies across the world. Each person donating their brain will go all over the world and be part of many different studies and hopefully many different important results that will contribute to these efforts. And the last thing I want to share with you is we all can help any one of us. And this is because every study on every brain disorder, including Huntington, needs to rely on a comparison group. So not only people that are suffering from, for instance, Huntington disease, but also people that are not affected by the disease will need to go in these studies. And therefore we can all consider becoming brain donor and really leaving a legacy for everybody after us. And with this, I would like to end by thanking for, first and foremost, all tissue donors and their families. Without them, without their generosity, without their selfless gift, no research would be possible. We thank the NIH for allowing us to do this work, but most of importantly, I would like to thank you all for listening to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I actually just have a question. The Healthy Donors, is that covered by the NIH grant as well? Yes, yes. I do have one and it may have, it may not even be a good question because I'm just not so familiar with how all of this works. But if you're helping other neuro diseases within your bank, do all HD brains, all donations remain in HD studies or do pieces and parts of it um, get distributed throughout other studies? And kind of the same thing with, say, I'm a healthy HD family member. And if I were to donate my brain, would my brain be able to stay within HD studies or would that just be used as you guys see fit? Yes, those are actually really good questions. So thank you for asking them. Yeah. Typically, 
tissue sample from people with Huntington will go to Huntington studies okay. or to studies that are very similar, for instance, other repeats, nucleotide repeats that are relevant to this study. Okay. The brain donation from people that didn't suffer from brain disorder do contribute to any study on any brain disorder, so we can keep them segregated only for studies on Huntington. But again, each brain contributes to hundreds of studies. So That's amazing. And this is because, again, we send as little as is needed or as much as is needed. And there are many different parts of the brain that can be studied for different disorders. So for instance, in Huntington, there are particular parts of our brain that seem to be more relevant. And, but there are other parts that may be less relevant and they may go to studies on other brain disorders. So because of that, although we cannot limit donations from people that didn't suffer from brain disorders to a particular study, almost certainly they will go to a lot of studies on Huntington. Thank you. Thank you for making that clear. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question. And you guys, if you guys have any questions about this, you can connect with Katrina and myself and we will hook you up with Sabina's contact information. And then there was also numbers and resources on the slides as well. But if you get stuck or you have any kind of like questions that you don't think apply to that, we will definitely connect you guys to in the, the Harvard Tissue Resource Center so you can get all your questions asked. I think that will do it today. Thank you for so much for coming on with us once again. And don't forget to this video and subscribe to the channel below and ring the bell for notifications when more videos like this come out. Until next time. Mm -hmm.